Thomas Rogue is one of Britain's finest filmmakers. He's been in the business since 1947 and from humble beginnings worked his way up to become a leading cameraman. His photography distinguished a wide range of popular films in the 60s, including Far From the Madding Crowd and Lawrence of Arabia, on which he was also second unit director. In 1970, Mick Jagger appeared in the controversial performance, which earned Rogue his first full director credit. Since then, he's created a succession of equally stunning and unpredictable films, wholly personal in style, without any concessions to popular Hollywood fashion, yet starring international names in exotic locations. Each film has attracted its share of argument. The critics and the public tend to admire Nick Rogue's pictures. Distributors have often been less enthusiastic. Yet there's no way they can overlook an experience like Walkabout, with the sparse but perfect screenplay by Edward Bond, or Don't Look Now, which starred Donald Sutherland and Julie Christie, and The Man Who Fell to Earth, with David Bowie. And now, of course, the extraordinary poetic violence of his new film, Eureka, with Gene Hackman. Nick Rogue is a shy, almost reticent figure, seldom prepared to speak in public. But there's no doubt that he's a powerful talent in our midst. It's with very great pleasure that we're able to welcome him here to talk to us all tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Nicholas Rogue. Think of you as a. I've got, to, I've got to say one thing. That uh, a couple of weeks ago, I broke my jaw, and so it's wired together. And so I, I know I mumble, but um, this is mumble plus mumble, <laughs> so I can't open my mouth. It's been uh, Some might say good. one of the uh, particular difficulties that under which Nick has been labouring for the past few weeks for a, a while. There, we thought he wasn't going to be able to make it at all, but uh, his jaw is. But for somebody whose jaw is totally wired up, he's the most lucid person I've ever met, so don't let it worry you. Nick, we think of you as a British filmmaker, and of course you're based in London, and your, your team is British. You know, Jeremy Thomas, your producer for Eureka, Paul Mayersberg, your writer for Eureka, Alex Thompson, cameraman for Eureka. But your style is not really a British style at all, is it? Where does it come from? Well, I don't really think that... Um there is such a thing as a, a British style or American style. I, you must understand, I began in movies. It's a very young guy. So the style was dictated really by American films, and, and they'd, they'd, uh, they'd developed the grammar of film that um, then swept across the world, a kind of easy, easy knowledge of film. There's something that, that happened um, I guess, with the coming of a star system. Mm. And um, I suppose there was the people of my age are the first or the second generation of realizing what the cinema is. I mean, my children think of everything visually, because they come in, go to watch television, and media, practically everything is, is a visual exchange and gradually drifting away from a, a literary background, I guess, and, or a written background. Mm. So I don't, I don't look on, on uh, and, uh, what my work as a particularly un-British way. I'm looking at it as a film. I don't think of myself as an un-British um, fil no, filmmaker. It is totally different, surely, from the... For example, the, the series of films on which you worked as a cameraman in the, in the 60s. Uh, I can't think of any other director you worked with during that period, which and it was quite a range from David Lean through to Francois Truffaut, uh, who had a, a style that gives hints that uh, you would adopt the style that you uh, have eventually chosen for your films. Except there were other directors at that time working that I, I remember 
As a cameraman, I liked the idea of what they were doing. When you got the job as second unit cameraman, wasn't it, for uh, Lawrence of Arabia, did you get the chance to experiment there? Or were, I mean, were you sent out very independently and allowed to, to get on with the, the scene in the way that you wanted to shoot them? The second unit director was a man called Andre de Toth. And um, we worked together, for, but, but very much. I, I have a great feeling about about uh, second units. I suppose every director must have, and I, I, I kind of felt that, having, having worked on first units with second unit directors, and there are all odd things that happen with second unit directors and, and second unit cameramen for the first unit, that everybody wants to be a hero. <laughs> and they, they suddenly, they see things that can't fit into the film and try and, try and make their own film. No matter what happens, it's very difficult to shoot. It's very difficult to observe a discipline of a second unit. Our second unit on Lawrence got a bit, a bit out of hand. And, uh, and um, Andre de Toth left. And having seen one person bite the dust, <laughs> I decided to toe the line and shoot what was what asked for. <laughs> <laughs> what had you shot up till then? Well, wasn't asked for. Andre had some marvellous ideas and thoughts that I thought would be rather, rather, I thought they were rather good, actually. I remember one, you know, one thing when he said um, to David, he, he had an idea, you know, the second unit director offers up um, ideas and they, there are certain shots to be, to be done to fill in uh, mm. exactly into the scene. And that, um, on a, on a a movie that size, you know, the things changing the whole time, the ideas that a second unit director can offer up. And, and I don't think they were quite suited. Andre had made many movies of his own, you know, anyway. And um, I remember one, one uh, afternoon, he went to see David and he said, I've had this wonderful idea, Andre de Toth said, you get a great big mirror. It's fantastic. It'd be 30 foot long mirror will hang blood bags behind it. And then we'll shoot just at the angle where you don't see the camera and get the Turkish army to charge. And we'll machine gun the mirror, which is going to explode into, <laughs> into blood. <laughs> and I remember him saying to, to David Dean, this is incredible, David. Can you imagine? And David Dean's are disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> And that was, Andre, was the beginning of Andre leaving. <laughs> well, we've been talking about other directors, you can't write Talk about how did you get to walk about and uh, where did the story come from and how did you manage to set it up for yourself, having been a, a cameraman so long? <laughs> I don't know whether he read the book or not, but the book was only a shell mm. from, for, to get out of the, the book what wanted to make of a film. Anyway, I went off to Australia and looked for the locations and, um, and to try and find Aboriginal boy. And I was there, we went with the associate producer, I went and, and uh, really try, trying the logistics of the thing because it was a hell of a lot of ground to cover. And I was gone about, I guess, about uh, three or four weeks. And uh, Edward said, I think I'll have a first idea of the thing. I think I'll, I'll, I'll try and finish something by the time you get back. We'd been meeting at various places. Up in, he'd had a cottage up in Cambridge and in town. But just talking, really, around the subject, around this journey, around these children, what, what um, the film was about. I got back and he said, oh, quickly, come up to Cambridge. I've finished it. It's fantastic. I love it. And I remember I drove to Cambridge, and um, he'd got, and he said, that's it, it's finished, that's good. I'm very happy because I'm going to start a new play now. Mm -hmm. I said, fine. <laughs> and he said, OK, where's my money? <laughs> As we talked to someone else about that. <laughs> and it was 14 pages. <laughs> and, uh, uh, well, I read it. It was the film. I mean, it was what, uh, because he'd left out all that, um, dark clouds scurrying across a blue sky, like mm. bruises and all things that, you know, fill in the, he just 
had got pure dialogue, was it? Dialogue, and um, they go somewhere, mm. you know. <laughs> and Abbo, X, 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 he'd go on. <laughs> Girl replied, because we'd talked over what the scene was going to meant. Mm. So, and Abbo, X, 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 he'd go, go. Mm. Oh, really? You know, boy, come on. <laughs> and um, I was quite excited by it. Um, Where did you find David Gunther? When we arrived in Australia, it was an Australian production manager. said, is this a short? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in a way. <laughs> Where did you find uh, the Aboriginal boy? I mean, we, in were Australia, in, sure, we were in about 10 you? days of, of shooting, and um, I still hadn't found him. I'd seen mm. a lot of young guys, and they were very, very marvelous, but tremendously shy. Understandably so, and um, I was just up in Darwin, just by the pure luck. You know, I was in Darwin, and um, an Australian nurse. He was living at that time. David was living at a mission outside uh, Darwin, and she said, "There's this extraordinary young man." Palingape Jarle, Palingape, Pan Boal Bolian, Oba Bellak Nyam Yene Narangar Bapon Nirin Yokon Yungo Pulma, Nara Yening or Gokar or Mangadawa. Water. Drink. We want water to drink. You must understand. Anyone can understand that. We want to drink. I can't make it any simpler. Water. To drink. The water hole has dried up. Where do they keep the water? I think I think probably that that that, that, that clip that, that just showed. Um, I like that idea of, of uh, it's in a way like movies. I mean, inside the clip is like movies because the girl has all the capability of one culture or one attitude of explaining, I would like some water, please. Absolutely means nothing mm. at all. Oh, good, you know, hello. Mm. <laughs> and uh, the boy, gets it, you know, forget all this, you know, what he's looking at is, oh, we've got to get some more, I've got to get some water here, oh, mm -hmm. and, oh, you know, so that, um, there are different ways of, I mean, I'm just maybe diverting, but there are different ways of looking at things, or even listening to things, so, I mean, it's all, it's kind of inside that, that piece, but when we work on a, on the screenplay, it's not, sort of like, Pipe puffing, and I'm that's it, it's all written. Out, or just oh, it didn't turn out like it. it's, it's still I like it fairly spare because a lot of the just 
a lot of what's on the screen is only in, in a discussion about how it will be. Otherwise, the script would be that thick if mm. you had put every, you know, it would be gigantic. Mm. So. Well, with the, the film after Walkabout, which was Don't Look Now in 1973, the complexity of the film is so enormous that I, I find it very hard to see how it could have been, how in a way it couldn't have been pre-planned. <coughs> well, um, I think I like doing a lot of preparation on thinking about what it's about and talking with about what it's about and stories around what it might be about, each scene, that is. And then you have to finally commit something down, have someone read and say, what's this about? <laughs> but um, each scene is still quite spare and I like to be able to um, I say keep keep changing it or moving it. I remember there's a scene in Don't Look Now that um, was quite a long piece when uh, after after the accident with um, two women and the girl and, and uh, Laura falls over the table at the beginning when she thinks uh, she's met the me when she's met the medium mm. that who th says she'd seen the daughter comes back in the restaurant. And then she goes to the hospital and goes into a light a candle in the church. Mm. And I know these are sort of film stories, but it, it's, I can only say it's, it's, it's the, it's just keeping an eye out or trying to be there the whole time with remembering the scene, but open to its change. That's not, not ad limb again, but open to its change all the time. In the church, when we were setting up, it was quite a long scene of an exchange between them because he doesn't want her to light the candle. And, and Julie Christie and Donald Sutherland were wandering around and Donald said, uh, I don't like this church. Just, we just sort of, and she said, well, I do. And she got, got angry with him. I do. Is you know, you're awful, Donald. I don't like the church at all. Well, I do. Any change? Yeah. I'm going to light a candle for her. How much are candles? Fifty. We don't have any fifties. Maybe I'll light six. You've got electricity in it, and it's hanging thing. Mm. I thought that's a terrifically, it seems much more in the mood than this. That's kind of war. I wanted to maintain that sense between them of a husband and wife, a man and woman that, that weren't, that were lovers, were in love, but not um, in some remote area, they were able to be offhand with each other or be able to, with, mm. with, with some kind of love showing through all the time. And his attitude in that, he had compassion when she wanted to write, light a candle for the child, but didn't, oh, come on, mm. let's go, you know, but all right, well, that's okay. I think one of the most uh, disturbing things about that sequence, uh, when uh, the two ladies are encountered for the first time is the way you shoot so much of it in mirrors. Uh, and this, this leads me to the question about pre-planning, whether you require a lot of mirrors to be there or whether they were there and you decided to make use of them. And let's jump that one to the, the main question, because why do you finally decide to use them? Mirror is a wonderful thing. Goodbye, said the dying man as he looked in the mirror. I shan't be seeing you much <laughs> anymore. But, um, they're always, there's something that you examine other people and you see a different face, a different side of them all the time. Yeah. And that's, I think that's, and I like to see the person and their reflected image. I think that's, um, something happens also to people when they look in the mirror. They, they either, they, they certainly behave differently or they're either shocked or <laughs> interested. 
<coughs> themselves or something. Yes, I, mm. I think well, there's the um, end of Eureka for me comes with uh, Claude confronting himself in the mirror. He couldn't again. resist, for, and he remembered as well. And, and Tracy has said in the dock, I see a man, what do you see when you, I see a man who can't pass a mirror without yeah. looking into it. Yeah. There are some, I, I remember in uh, Reflections in the Golden Eye, the marvelous moment when Brando just going up the stairs and he stops and looks in the mirror. Mm. His eyebrow. It's just, it's definite. And then, and we'd seen in a scene earlier in Eureka when um, Claude turned away from McCann because of the girl, McCann's maid, the black mm. girl, was coming down, down to take the bottles from McCann. Something that um, he'd been in the dining room, which he also found out, but uh, he looked away and he looked in the mirror and, and McCann saw him see there was something between the girl and Claude that McCann caught in a Yes. In the mirror with his back turned. Yeah. But it has the, the, the other stage to it where the mirror becomes broken. I mean, right at the start of Don't Look Now, you have glass shattering, causing one accident. And, and really, there are other accidents of the same kind throughout the film. Totally unpredictable, isn't it? As uh, I know, I think with with the uh, motor car windscreens now, they will just shatter into those form pieces wonderfully. Mm. You know, the, a lot of the fear of you know, shattered glass is so unpredictable. Well, let's move on to the man who fell to earth. Uh, the how did that subject come to you? What decided you to make that film? I've been given a copy of the book some time before about what, how about making this a movie. And uh, I don't think much about it. It was a book by Walter Tabis, who wrote The Hustler. And um, I didn't think about it too much. I liked the idea of it. It was very much more sci-fi in, in very straightish sci-fi. And it's good. He did good. I like. I don't, I like the novel. Mm -hmm. And the novel seemed to be able. I'd be able to use a starting point of that. Something, a, a situation where you've been, in which you've been put that is absolutely out of your control, but your and your emotions have been left somewhere. But uh, life must go on. How to can how to survive, you know? mm. so, and, uh, and in um, The Man Who Fell to Earth, like, that's how, you know, I suddenly thought, God, this story, that, uh, I can, and I talked about it with Paul, and we talked, and then it began expanding, and that's um, mm. how it came about. Do you th think that uh, McCann's life is out of control in Eureka? Out of control? Yeah. No, I don't think it's out of control. So I think the people around... So he's not another man who fell to Earth, Oh no, I think that um, he's a man who's achieved his obsession. You know, to, uh, that it's a very dangerous, there's a point that um, an obsession can take over and then, uh, then the next danger is that um, you'll be satisfied with it. Would this uh, same, uh, in the same way be true of the central character in Bad Timing by the end of the film? Well, they they uh, characters in bad timing their obsession wasn't allowed to complete itself was it it, it uh, what happened desperately there is that they're caught in this, this terrible sensual obsession that 
and become beyond jealousy that it becomes a, a desperation of possession, both one for the other. from our eager audience. Yes? How did you come to choose Jenny Agatha for the girl in Walkabout? I saw a lot of her girls and I saw, I saw Jenny. She was then, uh, when I first saw her, she was 14 and I, just 14, 13 and a half. And I went back to her when she was 15. <laughs> but I just saw lots of girls. I only came to her through people coming to me, I guess, you know, trying to find, talk to, and go. Check the back there. I may have misremembered this, in which case I apologize, but wasn't there some connection between yourself and Flash Gordon? And if so, um, how would you have made it? <laughs> yes, tell us how. Quickly, quickly, how would I have made it? it was, yeah, there was a connection between me and Flash Gordon. I liked Flash Gordon very much. Um, it seemed to me the first time I'd, I'd been talking about it, and I'd, I thought, I don't know whether I could want to make it. And then I thought, this is extraordinary. I'd got all the cartoons. I spent about uh, four weeks going to work reading comics. It was, uh, <laughs> where are you going, Daddy? I'm <laughs> going to read a comic now. Oh, yeah. But they were wonderful. Alex Raymond was the first one that drew the, the cartoons. And um, I got quite, they all f became fables. You know, they were all curious fables. And w suddenly I realized that he was doing, Alex Raymond was doing something that he was getting away with something that he wouldn't have got away with th today. He was drawing the amazing pictures of Dale Arden being lashed <laughs> by Princess Aura, but the bubble coming out of the mouth said, Oh, that hurts me a lot. <laughs> and the fantastic drawings of a girl strapped to a rock and two huge sort of lizard men clutching each other and stabbing them in the eye and saying, I wonder when Flash will come. I hope soon. <laughs> and I thought, this guy is very, he's got away with murder here. <laughs> because they weren't reading the picture. Oh, I guess editors were saying, ah, uh, when's Flash coming? That's all right. There's uh, nothing to censor there. And it weren't actually, because it was a long before pictures were being read very swiftly, you know. And um, I thought this is tremendous. And they, it, I thought that's the closest link to film. As long as he kept those bubbles nice and clean and simple, 
the pictures, I mean, when you, if you look at any of the early King features of Pashkot, anyway, I thought this could be something, maybe I could do something like that, keep the dial nice and simple, oh, that, uh, and have wonderful pictures. And I would like the idea of the cinema being the one large thing with the, the opera and the circus and the cinema, they seem to go tremendously together and that Flash Gordon seemed to be like an opera in a circus, you would use circus before, I didn't think I did, anyway, that's what drew me to Flash Gordon. One more, one more, first of all. How well do you prepare yourself before you start shooting a particular scene or sequence? Do you have a preconceived, preconceived idea of what sort of, cam you know, camera angle you're going to use? Um, or do you actually improvise on the set? And how much do you rehearse your actors? I don't have any preconceived idea of the, of the um, camera angles and things. I visit the set beforehand and uh, I like to rehearse with them on, in, on, in the place, you know much more than than away from the place. I don't care for reading through with them very much outside the, or away from in a rehearsal room or in a hotel room or I like to actually work on the site. Maybe the night before we could stay on but um, and really see how how it goes. I don't I don't think um, pre-planning shots. Finding shots isn't, um, I had a lot of, I guess, um, training or whatever it's called, or just the actual finding of the shots would seem, would seem to me to confine the, the film a little too much of what is, or the excitement of what might happen. And I, and I think after a while one gets and that's working with the cameraman and operator, they get at the pace of, they get the sense of the scene and the sense of the, of how it's best, best photographed. And I don't, I don't pre-plan the shots at all. Yes, thank you. Uh, when Jack McCann found the gold, I think he did it to the background of Wagner's music. Are there any parallels in the film to Wagner's ring? Not, um, it wasn't, not intentionally, no, but uh, I mean, I, I think that, I mean, it was certainly the mystical side, no, uh, yes, I guess. Um, I wanted to have in, it wasn't through for that reason, if you know, answer your question, that uh, that music was chosen. I just thought it was, it's, I thought it was absolutely right for, for it, but, um, I did want I did want to have a state of uh, some sense cosmic sense some other sense about his contact with the cosmos something cosmic about McCann you know, not just a down to earth story of a man that just you know, the gold is 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 anybody's gold. to ask you the final question, Nick. It comes out of the very complexity of the soundtracks that you use. Your musical interests seem to stray all the way from Billie Holiday to Jim Reeves. Uh, in fact, it seems to me you must devote as much time to editing your soundtrack as you do to the, uh, the visuals of the film. Uh, do you have, are you admitting to particular musical tastes or do they, are they as wide ranging as the soundtrack? 
contracts of the I state. Like, I like to, I mean, again, in a, a general, try and try, I like to work with the musical director. I mean, I, on, it was wonderful with Stanley Miles and, and on Bad Time and Richard Hartley. But there are great many things that I like, but I also try and think what the people would like, you know, what, uh, and like a lot of source music, which is getting very difficult to get now because the music business is so almost impossible to deal with, but uh, getting source music, that um, it's prohibitive, that, but I like using source music, trying to think, I wonder what this girl, what kind of records she would play, what kind of music suits the character, you know, mm. I, don't, I don't care for, to, to give the film over to a, composer and a music director and, oh, it's a, boom, and it comes out loud and soft and t I don't mm. I think it's um, a shame mm. I'd like to be closer to it you know? we'd like to thank you very very much indeed Nick, for bringing your jaw along to us this evening and uh, for sharing with us your films for a good period and I hope for many years to come thanks for joining thank you